great to be here. It's great to be here. We're supposed to laugh. Well, this is being recorded live, so I uh, hope my boss is not watching. Uh, anyway, it, it is nice to be here. I, I, I worked for us for 15 years, lived in Redlands uh, for many years, and uh, my kids spent a lot of time up on this campus, so we're I'm very familiar with the area. Uh, it was great to see Rasul this evening because uh, I was uh, participated with the IRB for about seven years or so before I moved to Colorado. So um, anyway, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me and Richard and, and Jim. Uh, so we're going to, uh, this is a very interesting topic, but I, I'd like to introduce it the following way. How many of you have a car? Okay, of those who, who have a car, how many of you talk to your friends about how cool your car is? Who are you really proud of your car? You talk about maybe it's a brand new car, that's good. How many of you talk to your friends and family about a nice trip you did somewhere to the mountains with your car? Obviously the car came over. You talk about that, right? Nice trips, all right. I just described GIS, right? Now, how many of you talk to your friends and family about the type of gasoline you put in your car? Nobody. That's where I come in. So, I'm a data company. I'm the gas that makes the car, which is your GIS, go places which are your applications. So, data, for the most part, is a boring topic. So, I'll try to make it a little fun. Because without the gasoline, you're not going to go anywhere. You may have the best car in the world, the best GIS in the world, you may have the best ideas for applications, but if you don't have the right data and good quality data, you're not going to go anywhere. Do we all agree on that? Is that, am I right? Okay. So let's talk about that. So let me introduce a little bit about my company. So we're formerly known as Naftec. Most people know us as Naftec. We've been in the mapping business for 30 years. And if you see, it, if you move from the left to the right, you see we got the first European map in an in vehicle navigation system. We got the first map on an online portal. We've done a lot of firsts throughout the years. Uh, one thing that I'm going to point out is that you will see map all throughout the entire presentation. Very few times I will refer to GIS. And that's because my company has chosen to call it map. Mostly because a lot of the business that we do is uh, a consumer business. We are very strong in the automotive industry. Pretty much four out of five vehicles that have an in-vehicle navigation system have a NAFTIC map. So when people buy cars and things, they say, I want a GIS system. No, they want a map. So that's what, when I call it about map, you can do the mental translation and think of it as a GIS database, right? So, uh, we were bought by Nokia uh, about seven years ago. A couple of years ago, we had quite a, a great company called Earthmine, and we continue to do a lot of acquisitions. We're a very innovative company, and uh, I think you'll see that throughout the presentation. So we are 6,000 employees. We work in 55 different countries. And I was talking to my colleagues here at the table that I, for example, have one of the longest commutes in my company, which is from that upstairs to downstairs in my office. Um, and uh, I, my, my town, I live in Colorado, and uh, every year they have a bike to work. So obviously I can't bike from upstairs to downstairs, but I do get on my bike and I do a, a 10 mile loop and I eat about five or six breakfasts because all the restaurants that are offering breakfast to be bike to work. So, uh, I feel like I'm cheating, but uh, at least I try. Um, my company is very interested in the fact that I work from home. I live in Colorado. There's about 30 or 40 of us in Colorado. I only know one other person. And there's a good reason for that. And that is because a lot of those 6,000 employees are actually people who are driving the roads on cars like the one you saw on the screen before the presentation. So we are probably the only, uh, we are actually the only last major worldwide mapping company that continues to drive the roads in order to get the most accurate map. And there's a good reason for that, and I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so we're pa passionate about making maps. Again, maps comes out. We think we have a, a great vision for what maps can do and how they can improve our lives and improve our businesses and business decisions. Uh, if you were to, to walk away from the presentation today, uh, this is the slide that I'd like you to remember. 
these four points. We got technology leadership. We got probably one of the best technologies out there. We, we got a lot of patents. We have created a lot of uh, wonderful uh, technology and techniques and processes to create the best GIS database in the world. Um, we got the best read of automation. There is no way that we could process the terabytes of data that we collect every day. Each one of those cars on the, on the left over there is collecting mobile LIDAR, terrestrial LIDAR, LIDAR, so people call it, uh, video and panoramic imagery. And on one day, each one, of that co each one of that collects one terabyte of data, which is then shipped to Fargo or India, whatever the processing facility is going to be. So there is no way that we could manually process that amount of data to create great maps. So we do a lot of innovative automation, and I'll show you a little bit of that. The third one is perhaps one of the most important items when it comes to building databases or building layers of information and good quality data, and it's the consistent specification. We are in a world today where you're not dealing with your local shop down the street. We're, dealing, we're still dealing with that, but a lot of them are part of a major corporation. You're dealing with a major financial institution or insurance company or car company. They're building they're building map solutions, GI solutions all over the world. The last thing they want is to have a map of the US that is formatted one way, and then they go to China, and it's a different map, and they go to Chile, and it's a different map, and Italy is a different type of schema. So a single global specification has made us very competitive in the marketplace. And then the last one is field operations with a local insight. So I mentioned how I work from home. I'm a sales, business development, marketing guy, but a lot of those guys are driving actually their cars, and we got folks in the organization that own their own piece of the map. So there is somebody in northern Colorado, there's somebody around this area that works from here, and he or she owns that map. And what I mean by that is that that person is always paying attention to changes in the geography. Name of businesses change, names of streets change, the streets get closed, new streets are open, maybe a new highway is open, a new interchange, or something like that. So those guys, the responsibility is to be in constant touch with the DOTs, the planning departments, to make sure that all the changes that are occurring are going into the map. So that's, that's, a, that's a big differentiator as well. We got uh, maps for pretty much every, every country in the world. We have what we call out-of-grade quality navigation maps. Those are the maps that are actually going in the info navigation systems. And the reason we are, we have to be so good at what we do is because the last thing you want is a consumer, somebody driving a car and driving into a ditch or driving into a, some place they're not supposed to be driving. So uh, our modern companies put a lot of pressure on us to make sure that we have the best map in the world. And because of that, we can then turn around and license those maps, those GIS databases for enterprise use. So companies like Esri, and you'll see a whole list of those in a few minutes. Then we have, this, we're, we're, a, we're a European company. So here is owned by Nokia, it's a company in Finland. And we use a lot of kilometers in, ter in terms of miles. And uh, as you probably know, the US is probably the only country in the world that doesn't use a metric system. So uh, I grew up with a metric system, and I've struggled trying to live in two systems. Uh, it's not easy. So. Having a that on my, on my smartphone and being able to do the conversion is really cool. Uh, we also, in addition to maps, point lines, and polygons, we collect real-time traffic data as well as historical traffic information. Uh, a lot of processes uh, involving that as well. I'll talk a little bit about that. We collect pu uh, public transit. Cities uh, with natural guidance is a really, nobody can probably imagine what that means. And what it is is that uh, usually a lot of GPS systems or vehicle navigation systems are going to tell you drive a quarter of a mile and turn right on 40 seconds. Right? What we have done is as we map the roads all over the world, we identify landmarks that probably will never change. So instead of telling you uh, drive a quarter of a mile and take a ride on 40 seconds, we're going to tell, to tell you drive a quarter of a mile and take a ride where you see some landmark. That may be a, a famous church, a famous museum, or something of that nature. That's what we call natural guidance, which is becoming increasingly very popular. In addition to the fact that all of our data supports uh, dozens and dozens of languages. So you can get a map that uh, is going to talk to you in Spanish, 
and he's going to tell you whether you want Spanish from Spain or Spanish from Latin America or English from England or English from the United States and that sort of thing. That's the kind of data that we also collect as we build the maps. And obviously we've got a lot of street level imagery that we collect, uh, panoramic imagery uh, that we collect with those cars. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. As if you have a question you want to ask, please raise your hand. Uh, that would make it a little more interesting. So this is the car that I'm talking about. So we got hundreds and hundreds of cars, but this particular type of car, we got about 200 or so. These are the ones that come equipped with uh, the, the capability to collect street level uh, LIDAR, sorry, street level imagery, uh, and obviously the mobile LIDAR, we also captured the video and so on. Completely automated. In the old system, with the old systems we have, we didn't have the back capability, we could collect the video and so on. Uh, but we needed a, a, a driver and somebody sitting uh, next to the driver and the passenger seat collecting information. Now with the video feed that is totally GPS enabled, we can take that video feed, we can take the LiDAR and the panoramic imagery, go to the production center and actually collect and extract uh, number of lanes, the width of the lanes, how high that bridge is accurately. Um, that, what's the name of that CBS, and we can actually zoom in and read the hours of operations of the store, and things like that. All of that has to be automated because there's no way we can manually process all of that data. So we talk about, we make 2.7 million enhancements to the data pretty much uh, every day. Uh, this is what comes out of that card system with the street level imagery and the LiDAR. Uh, basically, this is billions and billions of uh, what they call a point cloud. How many of you are familiar with LiDAR? Okay, some of you. So this is aerial LiDAR. This is uh, terrestrial LiDAR, so it's from the bottom up, uh, which allows us to capture pretty much anything that is going on on the ground. And we get excellent panoramic imagery. The beautiful thing about the panoramic imagery is that then you can actually click on that image and because there is a, uh, a mobile uh, um, LiDAR or uh, LiDAR cloud behind it, you can actually extract a measurement. How high is that building? How wide is that uh, each uh, street lane and so on? So it's allowing us to be able to capture information. We, we're releasing this product officially at the SVU's conference in July in San Diego. Uh, and it's, it's, a great, it's a great tool to extract uh, quite a number of use cases uh, from asset management, being able to capture what people call the street furniture. Uh, benches, uh, is the sidewalk handicap accessible, uh, the type of trees that you have, light bulbs, and things of that nature. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty exciting, we call it reality lens. All right, we're passionate about our customers, and, and uh, why am I talking about my customers here, or some of our customers here? Because they, uh, they tell you, they work as a proxy for the type of quality of the maps that we produce. So, um, a lot of names there, but let's do a little exercise. So, how many of you have ordered something from Amazon and actually got to your house? All right, how many of you got a package delivered by FedEx or UPS? Guess what? You use by default here about content. So all that geocoding and all that accurate routing is determined by the quality of our maps. <coughs> Let's talk about how many of you have gone and used a Bing map or a Yahoo map or use an Oracle database of S3 software. Many of you. So you, chances are you use an Adir map. How about uh, how many of you on your smartphones you that use either AT&T or Verizon? Pretty much everyone, right? So chances are you're better for it by the quality of our data and those products to make a lot of business decisions and so on. And finally, if you have a Garmin device, how many use a Garmin device ever? Quite a few people. If you use a, a Android phone or a Windows phone, you probably use some type of here map and soon to be also on the Apple store as well. So the rest of them is uh, you probably recognize a lot of those brand names They speak to uh, the demands that we need to comply with in order to be successful in this space. At the end of the day, we're not the only mapping company, but at the end of the day, if you can win with a lot of these customers, it's because of the quality of the data. It's a uh, fleet management, fleet management and logistics. I mentioned how we've been in the uh, automotive industry for, for 30 years or so, also in the fleet management system. And there's a lot of, for those of you that work with GIS, there's obviously this navigation component, 
fleet tracking, optimization of routes, safety, and so on. So this just speaks to the type of, of quote customers that we have in that industry. And obviously, we're very strong in the pearl space. Uh, pretty much everything you can think of there, and as well at the state level, a lot of, a lot of wins related to our traffic content now, and uh, our maps for routing and geocoding. Any questions up to this point? Anybody who works in any of these industries that I just mentioned? What industry are you in? I work for FedEx. FedEx, thank you, excellent. Every time my FedEx comes to the door, he tells me, I don't have any edits. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm always talking with him. Anybody else? I work at Esri. At Esri, excellent. Thank you. What group are you in? Uh, technical support. Okay, yeah. So I spent 15 years at Esri. Nice. Great, great company. Great. Um, so if you look next time, well, I, I don't want to ruin the rest of your life, but next time you drive down the street, think about every possible item you could collect. So our company. Uh, <coughs> This is, a, this is in Chicago, near uh, headquarters in Chicago, uh, North America headquarters. Um, we collect, for all the type of different layers that we collect, we capture over 400 different attributes. You can sit there and think, 400 different attributes. And if you really start thinking about it, pretty much everything you see on that street, right here on this street scene, can be ca captured into a GIS map. <coughs> Not that every industry is going to use those attributes, but depending what industry you're in, you use this set of attributes or that set of attributes. So we continue to grow the type of, of attributes that our customers want us to collect. In many cases, we do a lot of new drives, not because we need to redrive the strip, but because they're asking us to collect another type of attribute that we didn't think of. Does that make sense? So it's, our data is not only rich in point lines and polygons, but also in the type of attribution associated with one of those features. Yes, sir? Is there an automated uh, identification in the imagery? Is there automated identification? Yeah. So the question is, is there uh, automated feature recognition? Yeah. And the answer is yes. And I'll show you a little, a little video clip of that in a, in a little bit. So just, just some of the industries we're in, uh, utilities, telecom, retail, uh, yeah, I, I think some of you are in the School of Business, uh, and it, when, I'm very excited that some of you are from the School of Business and are here tonight because I'm here to tell you that now that you're going to go and become a GIS geek, right? <laughs> uh, but what is nice about you coming out of the School of Business, having an understanding of what GIS can do for you, is that whatever role you go in, it may not necessarily be doing Java programming or building SDKs or APIs, you may be in a managerial position, but you will have with you the technical knowledge of what to ask for. When I started in this industry, we had a lot of managers and we had people who were just learning how to use GIS, and all the managers knew how to do is go to, to that guy or that gal, they'll make you a map. Well, what do you want a map of? Well, I, I don't know, right? I actually had a friend that got a job as a translator, and that wasn't the actual title, but that's basically what she did. What she did, she worked for a financial institution, and she'll talk to the people who were making a lot of business decisions, and then she'll go to the guys who were doing the GIS work and translate the business language into GIS language to communicate with each other. That was 20 years ago. In today's world, a lot of business managers actually understand the power of location as they make business decisions. So when you get out of the school of business, I'm sorry, uh, that's the power of the set of skills that you can bring with you. You're not going to necessarily sit there and build a map or build a database, but you wouldn't know what kind of questions to ask of the map, of the database. And if it's not there, what kind of content needs to be collected so that you can make better business decisions. So at the end of the day, you know, they all the old uh, comment of location, location is still very real today. So these are just some of the examples of the industries we're in. Uh, I couldn't not talk about ESRI. ESRI is a great partner of ours. Uh, and they pretty much have a standardized on the here map content across the entire ESRI platform. From StreamMap Premium to RGIS Online, they are definitely the, the world leader in, in GIS solutions. So we, you guys are very lucky to be back here in Redlands and, and benefit from, from, a, from that uh, geographical proximity. No pun intended. So uh, what do we had to do to build this map in the world? So before we get into that, 
You can read some of this yourself. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. How about this one? So what's shocking to me is things like 91% of businesses suffer from common data. 91%. 77% believe their bottom line is affected by inaccurate and incomplete content. Data. You, I mean, this is pretty real. I don't have to ask you if you believe in it or not, but do you believe in, in this statistics? I actually just made them up this morning. I'm just kidding. Uh, but this is very real. It's a real problem. And I think pretty much all of us can think back in our experience up to whatever age you are today, and you could probably relate to some error in some data, either at the bank or in your passport or in your school records, whatever that may be, some type of error. You know, there's a charge in your credit card that you did not make and things like that, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a serious, serious problem. And, and what I think, particularly when I see those two over there, I think, what if we reduce those by 50%, even 20%? Imagine what the, 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 um, the, how successful those businesses could be if you fix all those errors. Now, uh, the same thing happens, in, in obviously, in, in GIS and so on. So what we try to do is, rather than go on and start building maps, one of the things that we do is that we use a lot of local authoritative sources. So we, 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 we like to say that we got 80,000 local sources all over the world. We're working, those guys that own their own piece of the map are working at the local level to make sure they got the latest information, all right? We also collect, actually, this number is, much higher than that, than that 22 billion, billion with a B probes of data. So these are probes coming from in vehicle navigation systems, people using the smartphone navigation systems. We do respect all the privacy stuff. We cannot track any of you or anything like that. Lots of companies collecting probe data. That probe data uh, allows us to actually improve the quality of our map, and I'll show you that in a little bit. And now obviously we're making all, all kinds of changes all the time. It, it, if we were in a big data um, um, conference, I'll be saying, here for sure is a big data company. We deal with lots and lots and lots of data. Uh, I'm going to take the next 30 minutes to go over this one slide here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but basically, you know, you see some of that. So we need to be innovative all the time. We've got to have, hire intelligent people who really know what they need to be doing. And we need to retrain a lot of our employees all the time so they can create great products. We need to be able to serve the local needs. That's why we have people local on the ground, doing the ground. Doing the, and we need to be committed to quality. And then you go from the way out. Uh, we've got somebody from Estrin Tech Support. We've got tech support. We've got uh, business partners that help us sell the data and so on. So there's a whole entire sort of building block in order to meet the needs of the customer because uh, at the end of the day when you go and work, whatever industry you're in, you're selling something, you're providing a service to, one, to whoever the customer is. That customer could be a, a patient, could be a, a homeless individual, but it could be a car company, it could be a restaurant company and that sort of thing. So we have an extensive global R&D presence all over the world. You can see where our production center, we try to locate them all over the world. So we got people working at any given time. There is somebody always working, depending on what time zone they're at. Uh, we, in order to be innovative, to, to be successful, we actually try to do big creative. So we, that's what we collect in the mobile lighter. We build those cars. When we have a, a really significant we can actually build one of those cars in four days. Not, not the car itself, but the equipment that goes with the car. We can actually build those in house, ship them, and get it delivered anywhere in the world within four days if we need to drive that town for whatever reason that may be, right? Uh, we, then we collect the probe data, billions and billions of probe data. In addition to that, we have a very intensive community mapping program where our communities are coming together to get experience and they help us improve the quality of the map. We're trying to do our processing faster. So traditionally, we release our map 
a new version of our map on a quarterly basis. So in three months, we put new changes, uh, schema changes, whatever you can think could happen to that map. And every three months, we ship you a new one. That's what we do with us, for example. Oh, we're in 2015. You think every three months is good enough anymore? Today, we are in the cloud. That, there is a new restaurant and people want to see you the next day, right? So we're now, if, we, if you want, and if you can handle it, we can ship you a new map every two weeks, a new version. So whatever changes happen in the last two weeks, we can get it to you within two weeks, maybe even faster if you wanted to. And that's because today everything is about the cloud. When I'm looking at the map, in the case of the Nokia phones, I can actually download the map, but if I'm looking at the map, it's actually looking at somewhere on that map on the cloud somewhere. And we are able to actually pretty much on the fly, make changes, refresh the map, and there it is. Right? So that's the kind of world we live in today. People want uh, immediate verification, uh, if you may. And obviously we try, and that's what we call rapid refresh. So if you can handle maps every two weeks, we'll get them to you. Uh, we actually, on the point data, POI data, points of interest data, we can actually do that on an everyday basis if you want to download the latest batch of POIs that have been verified. And, and, and what that means is that somebody calls or, or say, hey, no, that, that, that restaurant is not only called that restaurant, it's called something else. Uh, thank you. Uh, we do believe what we're going to verify, right? So we don't, we don't ever take a change and accept that change. We like you, we trust you, but we're going to go out and actually verify, do whatever it takes to make sure that, in fact, that restaurant did indeed name the name change or move to a new location. Right? Uh, in many cases, uh, in actually pretty much in every country in the world, we cannot release a map unless we get approved from the government. Does anybody know of that? A few people I see any. So a lot of countries in the world, we cannot officially release a map unless the government says it's okay to release that map. We got um, a protocol of disputed territories. You can probably think of a few countries in the world. Who can give me a, an example of a disputed territory where Sue? Crimea. Sorry? Crimea. Crimea. How about another one? Kashmir. Kashmir. How about a really big one? Kashmir. 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 Huh? How about India and Pakistan? <laughs> right? Um, and China. All those. So here's what happens. We had two versions of the map, right? So if we go to country A, we had to, they approved that border. We go to country B, they approved that border. Obviously, they do conflict. And then we had to be conscious enough that if we're publishing that map in that one country, is the one that they approved, not the other one. Um, so it can get very tricky, legally very confusing, and very complicated. So uh, we had to be very conscious of those things. So uh, in, in 2012, when we started, we have a bunch of other cars. We got hundreds and hundreds of the ones with the new system. We started in 2012. Uh, in 2014, we bought this company called Earthmind. They brought better technology that we actually had. Some local company out of Berkeley, uh, better better technology all around. We brought in that helping us improve the quality of the map. We have now uh, over 200 vehicles driving the roads, including emerging markets. So it's it's a really it's a really growing enterprise. Um, um, uh, growing business, I should say. Why is it important that we use mobile LiDAR and panoramic imagery as part of our processes? It's very important for all these things that are listed there. But one that I would like to point out is this one right here. How many of you have heard of ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance <coughs> Systems? Anybody? How have you heard about it? I, I don't mean to put you on this spot, but... Uh, the conference... Uh in Las Vegas, they, they actually took a vehicle from Berkeley out, out to Las Vegas. Yeah. Out. So people took a vehicle from one location <coughs> to another. Did the car drive itself? Uh, actually, no. There was somebody in the car just making sure it didn't yeah. run into a bridge, right. but they made it that job. So that's the holy grail today. It's called connected driving, connected driving, but driverless cars, right? And we're very much in that business. And I'll show you what, how we have to change our schema to meet the needs of those cars that will drive themselves. Pretty much is happening now. But part of that is something called ADA. And 
what data halal asks to do is to collect the height, the slope, and the curvature of the road. Why is that important? It's actually that technology is implemented in a lot of cars today. And next time you see that commercial, there's one, I forget which fancy car it is, I don't have one of those. Um, it's the car driving and what it, do, what it does is that instead of focusing on the entire car, the commercial focuses on the headlights. Have you seen that one? And what it does is the car is turning, the headlights are turning, and that's because the car knows the road. Listen to what I just said, the car knows the road. The map is in the car, so to speak. So that, uh, and what this car companies are now doing, truck companies, I'm not gonna mention any, but big trucking companies can now put the map, so to speak, in the car, and the car, because the car knows when the slope is coming, and what the height is, and the curvature is, it knows how to change gears by itself and it's proven to be a much more efficient than if a human driver was driving that truck, which is resulting in less CO2 pollution, you know, release, uh, saving on cost on the car, saving on gasoline costs, et cetera, et cetera. And for consumers, us driving our regular cars, it can identify, for example, if you're falling asleep. Because what it does, it knows the width of the lanes, it knows the shape of the road, and if you're moving this way, either you you're texting, <laughs> or you're falling asleep, or who knows what else you do it, but it's going to send you some sort of message, right? It's going to vibrate, or it's going to send you a sound, or something of that nature. So that type of collection is also critical for the driver of those cars, right? So it, next time you see one of those commercials, remember Milton. I told you about it first. <laughs> I didn't invent that, but I told you about it first. It's really exciting. Very fascinating. Again, not that you're going to go out and do this yourself, but you've got to keep having an understanding of what the capabilities are. And if you are in school of business or whatever your business you are, you can say, wait a minute, there is ADAS content, and there is real-time traffic, and there is this and that. How can they, it's like you're doing a great uh, potluck. How can I get all those ingredients together and make some great products, create some great solutions? Any questions or comments? Right. So, let's talk about driverless cars, connected driving. So, in a lot of the maps that you see, we collect the street center line. So, you probably, if you're taking a jazz class, chances are you've heard of the term, well, do you have a center line on the road? Yes, we do. And what we do with our regular maps is that we collect the center lines and then we add an attribute that says, well, this center line is actually a, a road that has three lanes, or two lanes whatever that may be, right? And then you can, with the power of GIS, you can actually make it look like it's got three lanes, right? Well, that doesn't work for driverless cars. Because it has to know exactly which path it has to navigate to correctly move from the left lane to the right lane, or whatever move it has to make. So now, so what we're now creating is what we call an HD map, a high definition map. So if you notice here, Notice how much detail we actually have to collect. A whole lot of detail. So the, the driverless cars, when you hear about all this great technology, it's a combination of a lot of different things, but it does require the best mount so that you don't crash that car, all right? That, so it knows how to take the next right turn or the next exit on the left, whatever that may be. So just, this is a, this, it, uh, the, the picture doesn't do justice to what it looks like on the screen. It's actually a 3D map. Uh, yes, sir? Are those maps being stored completely in the vehicles, or are they cloud-based where the, the vehicles are actually active? Right, so are they in the vehicle, or are they access to the cloud? Right. Uh, you know, there is no, you know, there are, there is no official driverless car today. There's a lot of commercials, there's test cars, and that sort of thing. I imagine that in many cases it's probably a combination of both, and chances are it's probably sitting in the car itself. One of the issues is that internet is great when you have access to it, right? How many of you actually lose access to the internet, right? All the time. Uh, you go into what we call a Blue Ray Canyon in, in New York City, or, or this massive city with all these really tall buildings. You lose connectivity, so it's always an issue. So my company is actually uh, probably the only company in the world that produces what we call disconnected mapping. 
So you can actually, I just went to Seville, Spain, and what I did, I just downloaded the map and I put it on my, on my phone. I get that and it actually knows how to navigate me if I'm a pedestrian or if I'm driving, right? But if I need to actually use the web, which I could do, it's, the server charges going from here to Europe are very expensive, and you, it doesn't mean you go into that connectivity all the time. So it's probably a combination of both. As the web becomes much more powerful and everywhere, it's actually going to have an impact on telecom companies. The AT&Ts of the world, the Vodafone and the Verizon, more sensors, more things, more uh, technology, so that you can always be connected. So I'd just like you to take this with you. Yes, sir. Based on the information in the company here that was filed by Nokia, is the software owned by Microsoft, being that Microsoft bought Nokia? Yeah, so two things. So uh, Microsoft did not buy Nokia. We, we sold the Microsoft bought the, the, what we call the devices division. So, uh, so we no longer produce cell phones or smartphones. That went to Microsoft. So overnight, we went from being a smartphone company to a telecom company because we still have another division called uh, Nokia Network Services. So we actually help build the 3Gs and the 4Gs and the 5G technology of the world. Uh, so no, Microsoft didn't buy Nokia. They, they wish they had, uh, but no, they didn't. So we, uh, we sold that division to Microsoft. We still have the Network Services division we have here, which is the mapping division, and we have what we call Oops, I forget the name of the third division, but basically it's the one who owns all the IP, all the patents, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. One more question. Sure. So the software that's here, I know it's on the Kia phones, but that's what I do. Yeah. Okay. Cell phones. Uh, is it going to be available in the future for other devices? I saw you mentioned yeah. Apple. Yeah, so it will be. So the Apple is going to, it's on beta now. This uh, Android was released about three months ago, and I think on the first month there were three million downloads. It's very popular. Um, so it's available. The, the, what he's talking about is that uh, if you have an Android, you might want to check it out. So um, you know you can you can have a a drive. It's called here Drive. So I can tell it where I want to go, and basically gives me directions. So and I can tell if I'm if I'm, if I'm walking, if I'm driving, or if I'm taking public transportation. That's what we're talking about. And so that's now the Android is on the and it will soon be on the Apple as well. And it's obviously on the Windows devices. Uh, so this is very exciting. This is where the future is going. Please continue doing your GIS. It's, it's really critical. It's, this is going to become part of that. This is an article that was published um, on CNN, I think a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if the internet works. Uh, I, but you'll have it in your handout. Uh, obviously, it says Nokia. Uh, of course, they're taking the credit, but it's actually here. Here is the way for driving this car. So, um, uh, but he talks about the type of technology. Here's a better image. This is the kind of 3D maps that we're building. Obviously, they look different than the, the maps that we see that we all that we all grew up with. Uh, but but basically, there are 3D maps, and he allows all these cars to actually potentially in the future uh, navigate themselves. Um, but anyway, check it out. It's a really interesting article. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with with CNN, so it's kind of a fun story. All right. So, okay, good, it's working. So I'm showing you here, uh, 20, what do 22 billion probes of data look like in a video? So I'm zooming out, I'm changing the scale of the math. And now I'm zooming out of Europe. And we're gonna see the entire world in a couple of cycles. This is so, that's, that's what 22 billion probes of data look like. We collect that per month. It's actually more than that, but that's the latest number I have. So it helps us improve the road geometry. Well, how does that do that? How does, how does he do that? I thought you said you already had the map. Well, believe it or not, we actually can take this data and we can actually try to navigate this probes of data because we get a from it too. And we put it on top of the map and then we do an overlay analysis. If there are probes of data, a navigator in a segment, and there is no road underneath, it's because there is a road and we just don't know about it. Or what about that shape of that highway exit? Maybe we're off by 10 feet, for example, or whatever that may be. So it's this kind of information that is helping us improve the quality of the map. Actual physical probe data we collect every second, right? And 
The other thing that is kind of neat is that it, because we collect, we don't collect any personal information, I like to repeat that, but we collect, uh, we actually collect how people break and stop breaking go. Because that can actually, we turn around and we can tell those cities, this where a lot of people are breaking really hard all of a sudden. Why is that? Maybe there's not enough good signage. Maybe it's a really short term, right? So this is the kind of information we can then provide communities to improve their, um, and the RPMS stands for Restricted Driving Maneuvers. Why, if that street is a one-way street on our map, why are there probes going back and forth both ways? Either our map is wrong or they're breaking the law. So you can just sit there and think of every possibility. This is live data that we can look at every day of the day and help us improve the quality of the Who's providing the data? Yeah. So the question is, who's providing the data? Pretty much uh, uh, any. Uh, we put. A, we work with a lot of. You saw the fleet companies we work with. We work with a lot of them. We put sensors in those cards. Uh, so we we have sensors that are for companies that are doing across the country uh, moving goods. We have them at the regional level. We have them at the local level. Uh, a lot of taxi drivers are, are moving on some using some sort of vehicle navigation system or, or navigation device, pretty much any vehicle navigation system, every cell phone company that is using some type of map, we collect that information. And uh, is, that, is that a simple around the world that the providers, say, in China would provide that information? Yeah, so the question is, is that the same all over the world? The question is, we wish. Now, there's a lot of, uh, in the U.S., um, we're very spoiled. I mean, um, I can go to the USGS website or the census website and download a map and a bunch of data. In other countries, it doesn't matter on national security. People who work in the GIS industry have done work in some regions of the world, and you can imagine where those are. They assign a guard to be with you at all times, every time you work with the map. Nobody can get access to map data. So it's, we're very spoiled here. We should uh, sort of be thankful for that. Our tax dollars pay for that. So the answer is no. In a lot of cases, there's a lot of restrictions on the data. And so we get involved in a lot of licensing agreements. Uh, obviously, we got to comply <coughs> with uh, European regulations, US regulations, uh, protect identities, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's fairly complicated. Yes, sir. I believe you're trying to ask the question, but there's other issues related to security. Uh, yeah. National uh, Security Agency. Uh, yeah. So how, how do you address Yeah, so I, I cannot speak exactly how we do it. Uh, I can tell you that uh, earlier I was telling uh, our, my colleagues here that in my company everyone has to do ethical training every year. If you don't do ethical training, you cannot show up for, for, to us, show up for work. But what does that have to do with security? Well, it has to do everything to do with security because we're collecting a lot of data. You cannot, you cannot allow that data to be released in any way, shape, or form, either by accident, because I made the mistake of putting it on a flash drive and I lost it at the restaurant, or I dropped it when I was getting into the car, or somebody hacking into the systems and that sort of thing. So that has to do with legal agreements, uh, you, know, you name it. Um, uh, but yeah, we had to comply with a lot of regulations, and you'll see some of the standards that we had to comply with. But that's a, that's a very valid question. Yes, sir. By the way, this is your last question. Please. Our cell phones use as probes, so when you get the notification, would you like GPS to track you? Are, are these being used as probes? Yeah, so if you're in navigation mode, yeah. yeah. So otherwise, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that, although if you watch uh, what are all those police shows, they can track you anyway, so <laughs> I couldn't think of any names right now. Uh, anyway, this is very exciting. Now, this is your geography test. Which country is this? <laughs> the United States, right? This is January 1st of last year, 2014. That's 70... I think it's 75 million probes. What were those guys doing on January 1st, right? Going to grandma or trying to drive home and so on. So I think I have a pointer here. So you guys are very familiar with this country, right? All right. 
I'm going to give you $1,000. No, I'm kidding. I never knew nothing, but a uh, round of applause. The world tells me which large metropolitan area is that one. Sorry? Fargo? Ah, close. That's where they're from. Ah, very good. Everybody, round of applause. That's fracking. It's oil, gas. They don't even stop on January 1st. So it's, I mean, look at that. Compare that to Denver, Chicago, Boston. That's how large car trucks, vehicles, are in all those fields nonstop 24 hours a day. So that's sort of the value of just looking at pro data. These are just little dots on the map, and I can look at them and say, what's wrong with the map? Right? Here's another one. What the heck is that line? That red line? I'm told there was somebody who knew, somebody who could turn their navigation on an airplane flight. Anyway, that's why it starts like that. So, uh, we can't identify who the person was. But anyway, but this is sort of the kind of stuff that we can, you can look at pro data. I mean, it's fascinating. GIS technology has come a long way. We used to digitize maps. How many people have digitized maps here? I knew you were going to say that. I started digitizing maps in 1988. First time I heard of GIS was in the biology department at the University of New Mexico. It was being used to protect um, Bosque de la Pache. Anybody ever been to the Bosque de la Pache? We got one person. You cannot die before you go to Bosque de la Pache. I'm getting money from the New Mexico Department of Tourism. It's the most beautiful place on earth. I'm sure there are lots of them, but the wildlife, you can just go and camp or just park your car in the summer. You can see um, the cranes and the thousands of birds that come in for the night. And they come. It's giving me the chills. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. As well. But it was used for that. And the second application I heard for GIS, because I was working in anthropology, I knew people in archaeology, was actually national security data protecting archaeological sites. Right? Fascinating. Some of my other favorite things that I heard of was people who track icebergs with GPS and they sell that data to the shipping company. It's a GIS application. My favorite one of all, like, oh, you know how to tell you data changes 2.7 million per day? Data is always changing. Well, the best application you can go in if you don't want to make a lot of changes to your data Cemetery management. <laughs> Those guys don't move. <laughs> I'm not lying. There are GIS, GIS applications for that, right? So, again, I'm just trying to make it fun to give you an idea, but this is, we don't digitize data so much anymore. This is a great way to collect data as well. So, Jim, back to your question. Feature recognition. We collect all this video, all this LiDAR. And let's see if it works. It's a little jumpy, but you get the idea. So this is a, an example of, we get the video feed. It goes, we said this is a part of probably. Uh, it goes there. Technician fits that to the technology that we have developed in-house. And the video starts moving. And as he moves, he finds a sign. He says, oh, that's a sign. Looks like a sign. Let me go ahead and check in my library to see that find a sign that looks like that one. The best signs to identify, stop signs. Pretty much anywhere in the world you go, they look like that. In Spain, we call them a stop. Not stop sign, but stop sign, right? So, but here's the challenge. It doesn't mean every state, even in this country, is standardized on all the type of signs. Highway signs, because they're federal highways, yes. But you move from one location to another, there are, there are changes. You move from country to country, there are changes. So the video continues running and running, and what it does, it kicks out the ones that it cannot recognize. And it doesn't recognize it because maybe on that day, maybe some teenager, I was never a teenager, never did anything like that, damaged the sign, right? Or they put a, uh, I don't know, a t-shirt on it, or, or, or it rained and it got damaged, or it got mud on it, right? So it doesn't recognize it, so it kicks it out. So as much as we do, Jim, feature recognition, you still need a person to still go back and do some manual checking for those things. 
But this saves us a lot of time. And we're doing this is for science, but we're doing this for collecting POI data. What can it's a rest of what can the rest of that sort of thing. Alright? Any questions on any of this? So we also have something called Map Reporter, and uh, I think the website is MapReporter.com. It may have changed, but we collect Map Reports. So people like you, Esri sends us a lot of edits, things that they find wrong in the map, and, and we actually have automated processes to look at that. And this is a really nice graphic because let me talk about how good our maps are, but look at all the things that we do find that are wrong in the map, right? This address changes all the time. Uh, points of interest, POIs, it's probably the one, it's one of the ones that is one of the, that changes all the time. Road and road features, even though we, we, we drive everywhere, we map everywhere, there's still changes to that, to that road. But, and this is really critical because we collect real-time traffic information that we turn around and license the companies. Well, as you can imagine, there's an accident. How do we put that on the map? So just a little story here. So, S3, for example, licenses a real-time traffic, right? Now, when anybody tells you it's real-time, don't believe them, it's not real-time. It's near real-time, right? <laughs> Just imagine you're collecting billions of probes of data. You call, people are on Twitter saying, hey, accident on Colton and University Boulevard. We can collect all that kind of stuff. Or somebody's feeding a, um, a police car. We actually have people who all they, all they do all day is listen to police cameras. Right? Accident here, uh, traffic jam here, I just had a police car there, boom, we put that in, right? And it's who can be the fastest. Right. So we send all that information to S3 and that XML feed, they do some processing and they republish it on their own map on a five minute interval, right? And we can probably get a little better than that. There's a lot of work that actually goes involved in getting it from the time it happened to you actually see it on the map. So it's just an amazing process that has to go in there. And if you ever come to our office in Chicago, we've got hundreds of people with four, six monitors, and they're watching all those video cameras on the highways, right? So it's, a, it's an emergency, a, a, a huge army of people that are collecting this information every second of the day. All right. Um, so we improve in trying to improve the, how fast we can fix all those things and get them out and get you the right information on your cell phones or whatever uh, system you got to access map data. Uh, we have grown our community mapping program, particularly in places like Central Africa, which is sort of a forgotten continent in many ways. Um, and what we're doing is work with a lot of universities. We've got uh, as many people involved in the community mapping program, 6,000 of them, that are building the map, getting experience, helping us improve the quality of the map, collect that information. They have their own moderation uh, and sort of peer review, if you may. But even then, all those changes we get from them, they don't just go on the map. They still have to go through this process. Okay? We do, we do, you know, you can rate your, the people building all that content, but then we, we cannot trust them 100%. We still need to go through validation so it goes correctly because just think about the liability issues if something goes on the map and we get we get into a wreck or something happens and that's really yes. I've got another question for the United States. Yeah. So the question is do we use satellite imaging? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we use a lot of satellite imaging to help us validate as well. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much anything that can help us validate content from looking at a satellite imagery to looking at local guys. In many cases, we just go and drive there, right? Uh, in some cases, you can just pick up the phone and say, are you located where you say you are? We work with a lot of companies. A lot of companies come to say to me, and this happens because I go to a lot of traditions, and say, hey, you don't have my XYZ on your map. And I say, well, do you, do you know where they are? And they say yes. And I say, well, do you have a shape file? Shape file is a necessary format. Or you have some type of format with your data, and would you like it on the map? And say, I do. I said, well, give it to me. I'll put it on the map, and be there. You'll see it in at least three months. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Obviously, they had to accept and sign an agreement, make sure that was, that kind of thing is okay, right? Uh, but we do that work with a lot of businesses collecting the data and putting the map. Let me. There was a question back there before you jump. Yes, sir. Have you started using drones yet? How we started using drones? Not just get drones. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was going to make a joke about coming from Colorado, but uh, <laughs> the answer to that is uh, I don't know, and I don't know if I could talk about it even if I did. Yeah, drones are really tricky um, because it's fine if you do it until you screw up. Yeah, Excuse my French. Uh, uh, last year I went on a, on a cycling tour. We spent uh, two weeks riding in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. We went to Yellowstone. And I was shocked. Everywhere you went to Yellowstone, signs everywhere. No drones allowed. And the story, you go to the park ranger and you say, well, what's going on? What do you mean no drones allowed? And the story is a true story. You can probably find it on, somewhere on the web. But some German guy was using a drone and uh, he crashed. His drone crashed. And it wasn't all faithful, but it's the other one where you see all the steam and all the beautiful colors. I forget which particular side is. And it crashed, and he left it there, didn't tell anybody, went back to Germany. And they, they, somebody noticed it, they picked it up, and all the video, they were able to identify who it was. And he went to court in Germany, admitted guilt, paid a fine. Because you can't send them to jail, there's no law against it yet. So, what I mean by that is that the legal all the legalities associated with flying drones are not there yet, just like with driverless car. States are beginning to, to plan about that, some more than others. So uh, it's, it's very complicated. Obviously, you saw Amazon wanting to deliver, um, you know, it's, it's tricky. Uh, if, it's, if it's hard on a busy street when you're walking and you bump into people and that sort of, can you imagine hundreds and hundreds of drones flying over the place? I mean, there's, there's some way, as you can imagine, there's a commercial recently that I saw that on the news, anyway, it's really on TV. I don't think we are yet, but we are obviously looking at all types of technology, all anything that can give us, hey, we're, we're a for-profit company, anything that can give us a leg out to be, to be the best, um, we are. And Jeff? Yeah, um, so, the NASA big data is collecting data about the world. Uh, what percentage of that would be in 3D? That's like, uh, well, well, we collect the Z value everywhere. Uh, so, what about the mobile controls? Yeah, so, uh, so, in term, so different things of 3D just to get on the same thing. So, do we collect a Z value? Yes, so we can get the height of the value. Part of our uh, ANAS data that we collect everywhere is collecting that. We do collect building footprints that we can actually extrude, but if you use a software, you can extrude and build that, create a 3D scene, for example. The 3D map, the high definition map, that's something that we've been doing for two or three years. I, I wouldn't know, to be honest with you. I don't know how much we have, uh, but but we have to build it. It's, we're going to have to do it all over the world, just like we have everywhere else. Sure. Your pros would not be uh, no, but I, I can certainly maybe, I've been trying to put that on the latest web scene that S3 just launched on RGIS. I, I think I can put it on there and actually take that map and we'll put it in a, in a 3D scene. The map, if, if I have enough, and what I can do is how do I make it a 3D? But maybe if I have enough counts on one location or a certain area, I can make it look like it's a 3D desolate. There are ways that you can, oh my God, for, God forbid I say manipulate the data, but yeah, there are ways if you need to take data and represent one thing or another, obviously we know we all can do that. Okay, any other questions? All right, so quality. So this is just a, a snapshot of all the requirements we had to comply with. So we're constantly having to go through the risk all the ISO, ISO standards, particularly because we are a European company, but a lot of this applies to the United States as well. So if, if we don't comply with all those things, obviously that doesn't look good for our map. So when we go into conversations with strategic companies, they all they don't, they don't know what kind of questions to ask. And that's the beauty of you guys being at school here is, again, knowing what kind of question to ask, you know you asking the right question, you know how to ask the question to get the, the answer that you want. So these are the kind of things that we got to maintain up today. That's just kind of an example. Um, I think I got it like three hours, so we can go over this. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that, but just take a quick look at that. You'll see that in your handout. It's very, very complex how the whole quality system works, right? And that's one part. Here's the other part on top of that. So it's a strategic execution, planning and tracking, all kind of controls. Uh, 
real work testing, and then we want to make sure we got customer satisfaction. As like everybody else wants to be on that national report by that worldwide company that says, those maps uh, in, in this vehicle are gear maps, you know, and we love to be always in the top 20, right? So that, that sort of thing. Um, uh, real world testing, there's a lot of stuff here, you can look at that, but this one is, is the most, well, I think is the most fun, but they had not invited me to go on a real world testing yet. So uh, a lot of my colleagues, uh, they say, hey, next week I'm going on a drive. And what that means in my company is that you were chosen to go along with two or three other people in the car and XYZ car manufacturing company or, or navigation device and they're going to say, let's see if you got it. your map is as good as you say it is. We don't know, we just know where we need to show up. We don't know where they're gonna ask us to go. They, we don't know where they're going to ask us what kind of maneuvers they want us to do. And these are week long drives. And we either pass or not pass, right? So we do a lot of that. So sort of think, of, think of a final exam. You either know it or do not know. So um, it, it's really, it's really exciting. We have 1,900 validations before that map goes out the door. And it's great when we do it on a three, every three months, but now we've got to do that every two weeks. Okay. Okay. I'm not trying to scare you, but it's kind of, it's nice to know that, you know, all of this is involved in uh, having a good quality map. Any questions? So, uh, here's a really good example. Um, this, is, uh, this is the total score. And I'm sorry, it's not, well, it's not so good, but on this particular geography, and you know, geography can be anything. It can be an entire city, it could be a neighborhood, it could be anything, depending how the customer or how we internally, we actually do a random testing. So it's not always Redlands, California. It's a random system that goes on and says, this month we're going to test this city, that city, and that city, right? And we give ourselves a grade. So this one, geometry, we got 90, 94.2, speed limit, we did very well, 97%. Z value, Jim, 100%, all right? But it's not like that all throughout, right? It's uh, RPM, restricted driving maneuvers. That one we got almost 91%. So our folks in quality are going to look at this and say, well, we got an overall rating of 97.3. Sounds really good. But then we look at these figures right here. We know where the problems are for that geography. So that's going to trigger a series of processes because we want to improve that geography, right? Our goal is always to get to 100%. Chances of ever getting to 100%? No. It's never going to happen, period. No matter how hard you try, it's just impossible. Things are always changing. Right. Is this? I mean, this is very helpful. Any any questions? Yes, sir. What's what's an acceptable score? Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, that's a great question because I think I asked that question when I started. The anything about ninety is good. Anything about ninety five is completely really cool. Anything about ninety seven point five is excellent. But you know, I don't think you'll ever. So. The reason I'm giving you the two is because we, we don't, this is nice, right? But that you really need to sort of open the hood and see, because this could be three one hundreds and five sevens. I, I don't know if that adds up to 97, but, but you get the idea, right? Right? So we test ourselves all the time. We do quality control. We do um, uh, unannounced audits of our own employees who are building maps. You may show up on Tuesday morning and the next thing you know is that audits are there. How are you doing your work? Not because we're being mean. We're not picking a gym or a digit. We just want to make sure they're following all the rules and it's not meant to hurt them or whatever, right? It's just to, we gotta do that. So people are always doing their best. Okay? Because at the end of the day, it's businesses are failing. That's an extreme, but you, you make better decisions or not because the quality is not good or somebody's getting into an accident or not, right? Or FedEx is not able to deliver that product what they say they would. That's all. So, this is the question. So does here, based on everything you saw, 
do we ever make mistakes? How many people say no? <laughs> I didn't do my job. So I imagine all of you said, yes, we do we make mistakes? We do. Really big ones. I'm going to show you a couple of that. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier with the region and he said, we're talking about, you learn a lot when you do things wrong or when you fail, right? Because you learn how to fix it and move on, right? Here's, here's two really good examples. Here's the first one. We got rid of the ocean in Australia. Oh, my God. You get phone calls. It was awful. Where's my ocean? Esri was one of them. Esri of Australia. We called Esri and said, hey, where's the ocean? Uh, that was a big one because we have people working overnight to fix that and get a patch out. Just like you get a patch of software, you've got to get a patch of data. That, that was bad. This one is, is, is really bad. So, <laughs> can you imagine being a cyclist and uh, uh, trying to drive and all of a sudden your system is telling you to go this way, but it's, you know better? <laughs> so, that, no, we make mistakes all the time. Right? Our job is to minimize the number of mistakes. Of we get reports on how can we do it each, each month. You know, where did we fail? We do it not only with this content, but with traffic. Every, pretty much every product we have, we're always talking <coughs> stories and how so we can learn from that. All right? Any questions? Yes, sir. What are um, the legal ramifications of these mistakes? Yeah, what are the legal ramifications of mistakes? So, uh, I took, I, I worked at Esri for many years, and uh, one of my good friends is Pitch Driver, who is an IP attorney there, and um, <coughs> He did some legal GIS classes in the past, and it's always a tricky issue. No one can claim, well, a lot of companies will say, uh, that the right question is what's your confidence level, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your confidence level? No one is ever going to tell you 100%. We'll say 98%, 99.9%. .9%. Mm -hmm. Companies say, oh, our servers will be up. We guarantee 99.9% .9 of the time. And when he fails, we say, well, that was point, part of the 0.1%. So it's it's just complicated, right? Yeah. So uh, we we try to make sure that we got the best man. When there is an error, we want to get on it and announce it, let people know. As we, I keep using Esri because you're here. But we 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 see something wrong. We're, we're telling them right away. We want to make sure that they know as soon as possible. The last thing is you want to try to hide something. Some, you know, God forbid, somebody something bad happens. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 we claim it's very high, we say it's very high, but and that's as part of, we can demonstrate that we're trying to do our very best to always put the best map up there. But, but there will be this, and we just get on it right away, we let people know, and we tell them what we're doing, and when it's going to be out, and we're going to get it out, and we have to work 24 hours a day. By the way, I was joking. You can ask another question. You. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, so I showed you that slide before. If you walk away with something tonight, is we're all, we've been doing this for 30 years. We're always trying to be innovative. We're trying to learn, use the latest technology, uh, learn as much as we can to, to get the best technology, automate as much as possible. The internet has changed a lot of things. We gotta get those maps as fresh as possible. When there's a when that bridge in Minneapolis collapsed, we were probably the only company that immediately made that change on our on our online platform, on our online map, right? And notify everyone. We do that all the time. You gotta be as fast as possible, right? Consistent specification global worldwide. That applies even at the enterprise level in your company. If you're using a map in this department, but you're using a different topic in another department, guess what? Those maps are not going to line up. It will be, it's just they're not. So consistent using the same map in both organizations. And if you're a worldwide company, you want to make sure you have a map in which the specifications are consistent all throughout so that when you're building GIS solutions, you don't have to think, oh, wait a minute, 
in this country you have to do something else, in this country you have to do something else. No, you do it one and you replicate it over and over in every country. And we got folks that own their own piece of the map all over the world. We got cars driving and that stuff. So in summary, we got uh, we tried to have the best content. We and, and, and here's an interesting thing, best content and best map. And in my company, there's a difference between having a best map and best content. So best map is obviously the GIS map. The best content may be real-time traffic, right? Because it's not necessarily a map. It's content that does on top of the map. That sort of map. Um, we're always trying to be as creative as possible and always try to improve on the quality of our map. We do a lot of world, uh, real world testing. We're testing ourselves. We honor ourselves. We try to create a best map. So what I'm hoping is that next time you go on that trip, please don't talk about the car of the trip. Please talk about the gasoline. Right? <laughs> so that's what I wanted to do. So, yes, sir. You're talking about people that are in business. Yeah. Or uh, business. What are some of the job openings that you can see yeah. that are management related or, or business related that we don't have a background in GIS yet yeah. that you can see in the future? Yeah, so the question is what kind of jobs are available there? Uh, lots of jobs. And when I started in this business in 1998, I probably, the number one requirement is that one, I was crazy enough to, I, I actually volunteered. I had a job and I went part time and volunteered at an um, organization, it's changed name, but in the old days it used to be called Technology Application Center out of the University of New Mexico. It's one of, was, at the time was one of six NASA um, technology exchange centers in the U.S. and I actually I knocked on the door and I said I'd like to work for free. And I and they said, sure, come in and work digitize for free. And after the three months I love my work, they hired me. Um, you better be able to make that kind of sacrifices and investments of that, that sort of thing. But back then, if you know how to spell GIS, you got a job in GIS. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's, 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 it's kind of a joke, but basically that's all you need to know. And in those days, uh, all of you, I imagine, here use ArcGIS or S3 tools, right? In the old days, I don't know if anybody here would remember that, I used to take the manuals home. And I don't know if anybody, but S3 used to ship the software, and it was two boxes, and when you put it on your shelf, I don't know that anybody has shelves in their offices anymore, it was this, this much. And I would just start with an A, Command A, and memorize it. And it was, uh, we said, build command. Build has an input coverage, and an output coverage, and a resolution. And I just memorized it. That's what I did. That's how I learned GIS, right? <laughs> Next thing you know, I was an expert. I was teaching GIS classes out of the geography department. But that, those were the easy days, not anymore. Today, uh, a lot of the jobs in the GIS industry are either going to be, you're going to be a programmer, and you need to know a multitude of programming languages. You need how to build APIs and SDKs. And half the time, we don't even know what those means, but we know what they are. Um, and, and, and that's what I was saying. You don't need to be the person that is going to go out of the school here and do that job. You, you could, if that's what you want. And there are some people who are really good at that. But if you study in business, Business is the holy grail of GIS in many ways. Why? Because GIS, even though there's been applications in the retail and finance and insurance and reinsurance, is still a growing industry, right? And in a lot of cases, it doesn't mean that you need to know how to do something. It goes back to what I told you. You just need to know what the GIS system is capable of doing, and you need to know what questions to ask of that system in order to achieve bigger sales, or to assign the right salesperson to a sales territory. So not all the jobs had to be that, that GIS, you're getting your hands dirty with the software. They can be, you know what, what you need to ask, and you can, I mean, there's so many jobs out there. I don't have a degree in GIS. Um, my background is in urban and regional planning. I, I never practiced that, however, what I learned in planning, because planning is about, a lot about geography, helped me get into this job at Estuary and do well at Estuary for all those years, right? Um, I'm a sales guy. I do sales, marketing, business development. And a lot of, a lot of that requires 
But now I have to be good at doing sales or doing marketing or business, well, but I gotta be able to talk the talk. I gotta be able to sit down, and I can probably, for the most part, sit down with anybody in any industry, have a conversation. But I also go back to my first day of planning school where my professor said, here's the thing about being a planner, is that you know a lot, but you don't know all the answers. And when you don't know all the answers, don't try to make it up. Just say, hey, I don't know, I'll come back to you, right? So uh, we're moving into the whole world of reality lens and mobile LiDAR, and I never worked with LiDAR before, but I'm studying hard to try to learn the terminology and all the way, what that means so that I can keep up with, with that. So it's kind of a convoluted answer, but there's a lot of jobs in GIS, but they don't mean that you have to be in the GIS department. You can be in, in finance, you can be in accounting, you can be in retail, and, and having to make some decisions as to where that store is going to be located or which ones need to be closed or whatever. You are actually doing, Jack would be proud of me if I said that, you, you'd be doing GIS without saying you're doing GIS. You know what I mean? But, I mean, let me just turn that around. Anybody who wants to say something, ask, help answer that question? Come on, somebody. <clears throat> How many of you are doing GIS today as part of your daily work? FedEx, so you do G G some type of GIS. What do you do? We do geocoding. Geocoding, absolutely critical. You got to know where you're starting from, where you're going to, and you may be doing an application where it's not just one truck going to 20 locations. It might be 10 trucks going to 100 locations, and that's optimization. There's a different type of geocoding and whatever. There was another person back there. Yeah, I'm actually, tech support. I'm actually an operations manager in our tech support division. I started off as, an, as a GIS analyst, so I have a GIS background. But then I moved into management, and it's kind of like your story a little bit about just being, now I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of a lot of these GIS analysts, but it's important that I continue to tie in just how GIS is used. So back to where you are talking about, our, you're using our info, which is what I kind of started with, this old legacy GIS stuff, yeah. but I'm very removed from from the actual technology now, but was able to develop in Esri as more of a manager, and I think that's ultimately, I think, what we were striving towards is that Esri isn't just about jazz people that know the technology, and I've developed in more of a management lead type of role now, and, and that's been really beneficial for me, but I'm very removed from the software. It's like you said, I have to continue to learn how our software is evolving, but from a, a little bit of a higher level, not down to the that's a great answer, and it's good because of the following old days. Just a little bit of history here. You know, you, you work at Esri, uh, you learn how to use the software and all that stuff. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the sales guys in the early day were geographers. Guys who graduated from geography or planning. You guys and me were good salespeople. And what did Esri do as it grew and matured as a company? They actually went out and hire real salespeople. It's easier to take a salesperson and teach them GIS how to talk their own business from a geographic perspective than to take a geographer and turn into a salesperson. <laughs> and it happens all the time. But they go out and hire industry experts. So that's a good word for you to remember, industry experts. What are you good at in your industry and give it that right flavor of the map of the geography. Every business decision we make for the most part has some geographical component. From where do we go for breakfast today to where do we go on vacation, where is that ATM, you know, what you can think of it, right? So if you can, if you, industry experts are critical pretty much today, because chances are there's already somebody doing GIS. A lot of jobs, they know they need that GIS, they may bring you in, not to run the GIS, but you know what it needs to get uh, acquired and what kind of level of expertise needs to be collected within that agency or company to build a great GIS system to support the business decisions or organization. So I guess what I'm saying is don't think that you're going to get out of school and you're going to work with necessarily the software. Just know what questions to ask, how to ask them to get the right answer. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? So I tried to make data exciting, data is boring, but you just need it. Uh, so thank you very much. It's great. To